half a decade, Jesse Armstrong tried and failed to adapt his spec script, The Murdochs, into a movie. The script is structured like a play centering around Rupert Murdoch's birthday on which he plans to alter his kids' inheritances. With Lachlan, James and Elizabeth Murdoch bickering over their proportion of shares in the News Corp family trust. Rupert, or KRM as he's written in the script, reads like an Australian Logan Roy. Lachlan Murdoch is as insecure and lacking in self-understanding as Kendall. James is as cavalier as Roman. Elizabeth plays the underdog sister who attempts to charm her father into upholding her inheritance. And Prue is the neglected, Connor-like older child of a previous marriage. As the inciting incident, KRM, pitches his altered succession plan to give his third wife kingmaking voting power in News Corp after he dies. In effect, throws a hand grenade in, locks the door, and pisses off. The kids say no, then Rupert says no to the kids saying no, and for the rest of the movie, they conspire to change his mind. In 2010, the script landed on the blacklist, Hollywood's most reputable and respected list of unproduced scripts. Armstrong, however, arguably didn't want to get it made. On page four, Murdoch's real-life six-year-old daughter appears, named as she is in fact. Now, adapting the life drama of a six-year-old kid without her family's consent would never fly, particularly given the Murdoch's place in the business and the unrestrained litigiousness of the family. Many writers write specs that they hope will land on the blacklist in order to win them representation or adjacent writing gigs. The Murdochs likely aimed to do the latter. It was a proof of work and an indulgence in Armstrong's intellectual fascination with moguls. A fascination which would take story form again, be fundamentally copied and pasted beat by beat into a world of fiction. And therein were born the Roys. Conniving, despicable, tantalizingly watchable, King Lear-like daughters and sons of the dying patriarch. All thinly veiled stand-ins for the family. All vying for fortune like attack dogs at meat. And as they do, revealing something about how inspiration and adaptation work. About how an artist sculpts drama from the material of human life. Life that begins with the story of Rupert. KRM, born the son of a famous Australian publisher, had a significant leg up in the world he would later come to dominate. He studied arts at Oxford before briefly working as an editor on Lord Beaverbrook's London Daily Express. After his father died in 1952, Rupert returned to Australia to take over his inheritance, the Sunday Mail and the News, both of Adelaide. He quickly converted the latter into a paper dominated by news of sex and scandal, commandeering his editor's positions. Do you, for instance, interfere much with your editor's policies? Yes, I did a bit. I, I get very involved in the newspapers themselves and in public arguments that we're conducting or involved in. He became like an Australian Gail Wynand, Randolph Hearst or Charles Foster Kane, a peddler of 20th century penny bait to the masses at large. I didn't make human nature, but I do know what they read and what they watch. I make my nut off what people really want. Don't tell me about people. I go flat broken a week if I didn't. Circulation soared, and Murdoch expanded into Sydney, Perth, Melbourne, and Brisbane. And when a rival daily tried to buy the papers from him, Murdoch front paged the offer, decrying the evils of press monopoly. The decades to come were defined by expansion into New Zealand, the UK, and New York, prompting depictions of Murdoch as an all devouring King Kong like killer bee buzzing over a city of potential victims. Murdoch became the largest shareholder by buying 40% of British paper News of the World in 68, prompting speculation that he was out for Robert Maxwell, his fiercest competitor. But despite the strategic move, Murdoch remained adamant that the purpose of the acquisition was to expand my own newspaper chain. I've got nothing against Bob Maxwell at all, I know him, and but nothing against him. After News of the World, Murdoch acquired London Daily The Sun the following year, then the San Antonio News in Texas and New York Post. While he continued to inject pulp-level intrigue into the world of traditional news, outwardly, however, Murdoch maintained a balanced view of the news and its responsibility. Of course one enjoys feeling of power, although the power of newspaper 
proprietors can be greatly overdone. We have more responsibility than power, I think. The newspaper can create great controversies, stir up arguments within the community, discussion, can hide things uh, and be a great power for evil. Publicly, he's more filtered than someone like Logan Roy. I fucking love it! In the words of the kids, Murdoch has an awareness of the optics. More information. No guarantee. It's like a bottle of fine wine. KRM's buying spree continued in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. He bought the Herald and Weekly Times in Australia and in the US bought 20th Century Fox and several independent TV stations, later consolidated into Fox Inc. He bought prestige publishers, religious publishers and textbook giants. Then founded Sky Television in the UK, which would compete with the BBC. Finally, in 2013, News Corp split itself into News Corp and 21st Century Fox. Then in 2019, sold Fox's entertainment business to Disney for 71 billion. So with all of that and four wives and divorces sprinkled in, the man has been busy. But now having scheduled his retirement, Murdoch faces the challenge of succession. The Murdoch Family Trust owns 39% of the voting shares in News Corp, with Murdoch's four eldest holding equal voting power. Prue is not that interested in News Corp and is like Connor Roy in the succession structure. Her husband, however, was a ranking News Corp exec, so through him she had some vested interest in the succession structure. But she's generally described as the only one of Murdoch's children not directly competing for his business affections. Elizabeth, Rupert's second, is a media executive with a penchant for story. She produced a reality dating show called Phone Swap, which aired on Snapchat, and is now executive chairman of TV and film company Sister, which blends BBC and HBO-style programs. James Murdoch replaced his father as Fox CEO from 2015 up until 2019 when the company was bought and his brother took over as CEO in his place. James now is an independent board member at Tesla and co-founder of investment company Lupus Systems which was in talks to buy out a 39% stake in Viacom. The relationship between Rupert and his sons has been explored in other works, arguably with subtle references in movies like Inception, where the dying Citizen Kane-like patriarch's final wishes are that his son go and be his own man. Which is exactly what James has done. He resigned in 2020 from the News Corp board, citing disagreements over certain editorial content published and other strategic decisions. This left his brother Lachlan as co-chairman of News Corp on top of his new role as CEO of Fox, where it is now on him, Lachlan, to patch up the company's scandals, and over time there have been many. Recently, there was the 2016 Roger Ailes resignation due to sexual harassment lawsuits filed by Fox host Gretchen Carlson, a resignation which would spur its own film retelling in Annapurna Pictures' Bombshells. And in 2005 to 2007, employees of News Corp's News of the World were accused of phone hacking, police bribery, and exercising improper influence in the pursuit of story. The investigation suggested that the targeting was limited to celebrities, politicians and members of the British royal family, but legal reps for families of the 2005 London bombing victims also claimed that those families had their phones hacked, and it later surfaced that in 2002 News of the World had broken into the phone of a missing 13-year-old Millie Dowler. Dowler disappeared while walking home on March 21, 2002. Her killer, Levi Bell Field wasn't convicted until June 2011, and it was alleged that after Millie's voicemail became full, a private investigator hired by News Corp deleted messages that he'd listened to in order to make room for others. Murdoch's testimony then claimed blindness to the whole ordeal in a moment famously ripped off in succession, and Murdoch quickly became the subject of castigation by those he formerly knew. We all did too much cozying up to Rupert Murdoch. I think we'd agree. And so, after 168 years of publication and millions paid out in damages, news of the world shut down. Given its endlessly dramatizable subject, succession became loosely based on the Murdochs, along with tycoon like Hearst, Maxwell, Redstone, and Sumner. The adaptation could have taken any number of directions. It could have been a cradle-to-grave biopic like Citizen Kane, Gandhi, or Milk. 
It could have been a moment in time adaptation, a story which gives a portrait of the life of a subject over a fixed period. Were succession made in the 40s to 60s, it likely would have been a great man story, one that celebrated the industrialist or at least viewed his succession troubles with genuine sincerity. It could have taken us inside baseball and, like Moneyball or The Big Short or The Two Popes, explored the inner workings of industry. It could have tried to expose the corrupt in the manner of Spotlight, the insider, or the president's men or hustlers. It could have taken an analogous world approach in which every character and story element stands in for something else. Or finally, it could have adopted a strategy like that of the social network. Adapt real world events with relative impartiality that neither condemns nor champions its subject, but instead uses it to present an idea about humanity. Humanizing characters otherwise remote from the viewer. What makes Succession uniquely excellent and why the TV format is perfect for it is that it in some way does all of these things. The show is art imitating life, a fictional analogue to the Murdoch world. World. For many, this is where the scandalous joy of it comes from, with whole scenes from the lives of the Murdochs copied and pasted into the show. The whole first episode of Succession is a transplantation of the original Murdoch script. It gives us a moment in time, with other episodes also running like stage plays over single events. Succession expands the Roy world through the power of implication. Armstrong shows us 10% of the world and implies the rest, to which we then apply our imagination. This is how great writers pack millions of dollars of budget and whole backstories into a single sentence. All those years blaming yourself for Rose? I'm not interested. That really wasn't your fault. Succession shows us less of Logan as an infirm old man than the Murdoch script shows us of Murdoch. Generally, we are, like his children, shut out. <laughs> Which is to our benefit, because were we to know the contents of Logan's mind, Succession would lose its drama. In the Murdochs, on the other hand, we learn Rupert's intentions early, while he combs hair dye through his balding crown. In so doing, obliterating the ideal of the elusive, unknowable tycoon. On the other hand, Logan's defiance of age and general opacity grant him an aura of dominant mystique. The spec and the show are similar, however, in that they both reject portrayals of the boss as loving or family-oriented. You're fucked. There is no man who does it all for love or some lost childhood. KRM even uses his own death as a negotiating tactic to strong-arm his kids, much like like Logan remains callous to his dying day. You guys off to the bathroom? Uh huh. Uh -huh. What fucking business is it of yours? Both Succession and the Murdoch script contain few true inside baseball insights. There are no Moneyball style scenes which show us what it truly takes to run an organization of that size. The closest thing we get are the endlessly dysfunctional infights and incompetent conflicts over corporate decisions. Conflicts which reflect the misalignment between generations. In the Murdoch script, James attempts to convince his dad to shift the business from paper to online. And in succession, Kendall spends a significant amount of the first season campaigning for similar digital ventures. His father has little interest. In the real world, when a rift grows between founder and successor, it's common for the heir apparent to forsake the business and forge their own path. When James Murdoch left News Corp to focus on Looper, he did so under the icon of the lone wolf, suggesting a man in search of his own independent identity. A Kendall-like quest for important importance, responsibility, and meaning in a world in which everything had been given to him. Where succession is most revealing is in how its characters suppress scandal. The show inverts the exposing corruption point of view adopted by movies like Spotlight or The Insider. Instead, the unseen world is shown to us with tension built around how or if the characters can keep the scandal hidden. Season 2's cruise ship document suppression, a case not dissimilar to the Millie Dowler case, takes us behind behind closed doors. Then, in juxtaposition, shows us the company's public face. Following Dowler, James Murdoch relinquished his title of executive chairman of News Corp's UK publishing unit. Similarly, Logan attempts to force Kendall into a blood sacrifice to appease the Waystar shareholders. Ken? Come on, really? Dad, no. While the Roys are petty quibblers with few redeeming qualities, each character has at least one. 
Logan's is the fundamental respect we grant him as a man who's built an empire. Shiv is cunning. Kendall is endearingly insecure. Roman has his sadistically strange quips. Well, I hope he can cure your serious case of being a bitch. And Cousin Greg stands in for the everyman who is out of his depth but eventually learns how to tread water. Armstrong stirs them all in together in a boiling pot of Shakespearean drama, then sprinkles on the irreverent humor that people love. Bill. The best boss that ever lived. It's like Mandela fucked Santa and gave birth to Bill. And the humanism. The impartiality of succession comes from the fact that, like King Lear and his conniving daughters, each has a fault. And instead of growing attached to any one, each episode and season gives new opportunities to change our point of view. When we watch them corrupt, coerce, and betray one another, we become as disloyal as the characters themselves. Those we sympathize with at the beginning, and not necessarily those we sympathize with at the end. And this feels true to life. Even Rupert Murdoch wasn't despised for all his days. But games can corrupt their players. And Armstrong knows this, so he hires first-rate actors who can imbue otherwise detestable characters with moments of heart. Shiv, I'm not here. And this is the beauty of succession. It takes source material, which is in no feasible way filmable, and gives it drama and truth and the greatest layer of protection the modern chronicler of Titans can give himself. Fiction.